In August 2023, during a pre-season training session for Kiewith United Football Club, I was involved in a collision that led to an all-too-familiar trip to the Queen's Medical Centre Hospital in Nottingham. An investigation into the shoulder and neck pain that I was experiencing began. After multiple scans and an arthrogram, the shoulder specialist revealed that I had full thickness tears in three of my tendons and recommended shoulder surgery to fix them. I chose not to operate at the time, but last week I ended up back in A&E with neck pain, unable to move my head, and this is my story. Last week I ended up in hospital in A&E uh, with my neck. Uh, I was una unable to move my head. I was in a lot of pain, um, and actually it was quite frightening. And in the days that followed, I, I started to think a little bit about my career, the training, the damage I probably did to my body during those 21 years. And when I think back to starting gymnastics when I was a kid, and I guess the physical attributes that I came into the sport with, and also the limitations, the biggest one and the biggest limitation that I had was my shoulder flexibility. I was always really stiff when I was a kid in my shoulders. So we would do an exercise with a, a stick. We would call it a dislocate stick. And you would di literally dislocate your shoulders. You'd take the stick over your head with your arms straight. Your shoulders would kind of like dislocate back and you'd bring it back. And, you know, there were some kids in my group that could do it literally with their hands together. Some of them could hold one of their fingers and do it. And for me, you know, my hands were like cr really wide. They were wider than my shoulder width. And I always had to close my eyes. It was incredibly painful. It was just naturally my physiology. I just wasn't built that way. Um, I had other strengths. I was very flexible when it came to doing what's called like a pike fold, where your legs are straight, almost like a hamstring stretch. I could do that very easily. Uh, splits I was pretty stiff, but I wasn't terrible at. Um, but yeah, at my back, to be honest, my back was pretty stiff. And actually, even sat here now talking about, I think my limitations in gymnastics when I first started were definitely my flexibility. Um, I was very strong, super powerful, but not very bendy. Um, and in those early years, that shoulder flexibility, it didn't, it didn't matter too much because I was doing very basic gymnastics. The only place, the only area, to be honest, that it really held me back was we used to do a competition called the NDPs, which was like uh, you would do old school uh, routines that everybody did the same. They were very basic. It was out of a perfect 10. We'd do our six apparatus in gymnastics, so the floor, the pommel horse, the rings, the vault, parallel bars, and the high bar. And there'd be an extra routine. It was called the, I think it was the physical body preparation routine. Um, and it would be a, a mixture of strength exercises, balances, and flexibility. And I always used to struggle on that one. I would get my lowest score. So, And it would usually be because of the flexibility. And in those early years when I was growing up, uh, particularly on the high bar, uh, I really, really struggled doing a lot of the uh, skills. Back then, the code of points leaned more towards doing turns where you catch in an inverted grip. So uh, you have over grip, which is like this, under grip, which is like this, and then you have an inverted grip where you turn your shoulders inside out. Uh, and for me, I always struggled with that. And when I would try to do these skills, uh, as I became kind of like an early teenager, I started secondary school, Again, my, my hands would slide right down the side of the bar and I'd be, they'd be really wide. It'd be like doing a, a wide arm handstand for me. Uh, I struggled with them massively. I used to slip off a lot, miss my fingers. Coach would have to kind of dive and catch me. It just really wasn't one of my strengths. But at the time, I didn't really have a choice because, you know, they made up most of the skills on high bar. So, uh, And when you're younger, when you're a little kid, you can't really do the big release and catches because you're so light, you can't bend the bar yet. So you rely heavily on those turning skills. So yeah, I struggled with them for a long time. Uh, and actually when I look back, like, particularly when we were on the rings, we used to just strap ourselves in and just literally just like do in locations and dislocations, which is essentially like that flexibility exercise, but at speed with power. And we would just go round and round and round and round and round and we'd do sets of 10, 20. And there, was, there wasn't really much like, I remember when I would perform those skills in training, I wasn't really thinking purposefully about what I was doing. I would just get them done. So I'd do loads. And I might have a session where I was set 100 dislocates or 100 inlocates. And like you, the shoulder joint is so complex because, you know, it, it's a ball and socket joint with so many tendons and, and things attached to it. And we would just literally just spin round. And I can't, I can't imagine the damage we were doing to ourselves at that age with in the joint, the cartilage, everything around it, with no real thought about the future. And uh, around that time, there was a, a coach that had come from Russia. Um, he had also came from Sergei's gym in Vladimir. 
Uh, nobody really got on with him very much. He didn't speak much English. He was quite an aggressive guy, to be honest. And um, I was learning a skill called a, a squat dislocate, which, again, doesn't sound nice, does it? And actually, there was a video where we... Uh, we were preparing for a competition that was potentially going to take place in Athens, and I was trying to do this skill. So you can actually go and see me try and do this. And, you know, I'm actually doing the dislocate. You can find that on YouTube. Um, if you type in Sam Alderman in Athens, you'll be able to find the video. And you can see the pain, and you'll be able to understand the exercise I'm talking about with the stick. Uh, but I was trying to do that, and it was, yeah, I just, I mean, what a stupid idea. I can't believe I even tried to do that <laughs> in my mid-20s. But, yeah, he would support me on a low bar, so... A high bar that's on the floor, it's kind of got two weighted sides to it, uh, and you would practice certain skills, so the turning skills where you try and catch in handstand. But he would have, he had me s sat down in under grip like this, and he would pull my feet towards the ceiling, and I had to dislocate, and I'd finish in that inverted grip in a handstand. I used to hate that exercise. I used to have to do like 10 in a row. And this one day, I don't know what it was, I think he was in a, I mean, he always seemed to be in a bad mood. He just pulled me so hard, and I was, you know, I wasn't very heavy at that time. I must have been... I don't know, 40 kilos maximum, probably less. And he's just yanked me up and my shoulder just went like that and crunched. And ever since that point, I've always had real issues with my right shoulder. And at the same time, we had the local newspaper came into the gym and they were doing a piece on me. I think I had just won the under 12 British championships. Uh, and they, the head coach at the gym at the time, uh, he asked me to do a, a crucifix for this newspaper. The guy was taking a, taking a picture, right? And I remember, like, I was 12 years old, right? There's not a lot of 12-year-olds that can do a crucifix on the rings. Uh, and a cross is hard. When you do a rings routine, you have to hold each strength position for just two seconds, which is, you know, it's, it's a long time when you're performing it, but for somebody that's watching, two seconds isn't a long time. And I was holding these crucifixes for, like, six, seven, eight, maybe up to ten seconds. I did five or six. And he was asking me to do it, the coach, and, you know, the newspaper guy doesn't mind. He's trying to get the right shot. And I can remember it, guy, get being sore and hurting. And afterwards, Sergey was very, very angry. He was really angry that I had done, said yes to doing the crucifix and very angry with the head coach. Um, he didn't voice his concerns at the time because, you know, that was their relationship. But that, again, kind of compounded that pain I had in that right shoulder. And, yeah, after that point, my teenage years were just, just riddled with problems with my shoulder. Um, I continued to struggle. And as I was growing uh, and I was getting taller... It, yeah, it became a real issue to the point at which when I was 17, around the time of 16, 17, I would only really train on the rings two weeks before a competition. I just, I didn't have it in me to train consistently over a long period of time for a full preparation. So I would literally just get to rings two weeks before a competition and start doing my routine. And because my routine was heavily, because I was well trained and my, my technique on rings was very good, never really caused me too many issues. It never resulted in too many too many issues on rings or mistakes in competitions, so I got away with it. But, you know, you can't just train for two weeks on rings. And then as I started to get into my later teenage years, I had to start training ring strength. That was going to become a problem. So, yeah, at 17, that was, that was a real issue. I just couldn't take the load or the capacity on my shoulder at the time. But I wasn't really doing anything about it. I was seeing physios, and they were telling me, look, Sam, you need to sort your posture out. You can see right now I'm sitting in front of the camera and my shoulders sat forward. They were saying this to me at 17, 18, and I was saying, ah, it's fine, it doesn't matter. I'm just a gymnast. This is what all gymnasts look like. So they would give me exercises to correct my posture and to work on the stabilizing muscles in the back. But I would, you know, I'd do this. I'd do them for like a week or two and I'd get bored. I wouldn't do it. You know, I wasn't bothered. It wasn't, you know, the way I saw it, it wasn't really affecting me now. I wasn't that, uh, that bothered about my future at the time. You just, you know, 17, 18, you're just thinking about the present. I had so much training to do, like seven hours of training. I wasn't going to add another half an hour of rehab to that. So, yeah, um, I chose to ignore a lot of the advice that was given by the sports science side. Uh, it wasn't a lot of advice. I didn't have a full-time physio. There was no one watching me in the gym every day. You know, it wasn't necessarily explained to me in depth why this was important and how it was going to affect my later life. But I continued to keep damaging those shoulders uh, and not doing the, the work on those small stabilizing muscles at the back to make sure I was in the correct posture, particularly when I was doing the actual gymnastics skills. Yeah, and I had issues up until the age of kind of 18. And then as I turned 18, uh, I turned senior, the skill difficulty ramped up massively. You know, I went from doing very junior gymnastics in the summer of 2010 at the Youth Olympic Games to a year later, uh, particularly on the parallel bars, doing a routine that was 
definitely a senior routine. You know, I was landing or starting in upper arms and five of my skills in that routine. I had a Homma, Suarez, swing double back to catch, straddle front, um, long swing double back. So I was doing big skills and I was still very much a junior gymnast. If you go back and you, you see me do gymnastics from that time, or if I do, I go and see videos of me doing gymnastics. I'm very slender, quite slight, probably a, more of a similar build to, to Max Whitlock. Uh, rather than the build that I ended up in being quite quite strong, a little bit stocky, and actually struggling to swing on pommel horse because I was quite wide. I had a big, I always had a big back. Um, so yeah, around that time I was starting to struggle. I was doing this big, big, big routine. I remember going to the Japan Cup, performing the routine well, doing very big, difficult gymnastics. But you know, at the time I started to feel a bit of pain in my my collarbone, and um, that got progressively worse. I continued training through it. At the time I was uh, just literally surviving on painkillers at the time, very strong ones. So I was taking uh, 400 milligrams of ibuprofen, those big pink ones, um, and also uh, diclofenac. Diclofenac at the time uh, was just commonplace in gymnastics. Uh, we all took it. It was pretty strong. It was a, uh, a strong painkiller. And the, the, thing that, the thing that was worrying is that with diclofenac, you were supposed to take stomach liners. None of us were told that. None of us were ever given any stomach liners. So we were just necking these very strong tablets every single day. Um, and, you know, that wasn't good. And it was masking a lot of the pain. Although it wasn't masking all of it. Uh, I had other injuries at the time. You know, I'm still growing. Uh, like I said, doing very difficult gymnastics. My body hasn't caught up with the level of gymnastics that I'm doing yet. My physical preparation wasn't there. Uh, and I ended up with a stress fracture in my collarbone. Um, so because I had that pain there, my shoulder was doing a lot more of the work to try and compensate. I pushed through. Uh, for about three months through that pain, still competed at World Championships, ended up t tearing my pec. So I had a, a, a torn pec. It was quite a, a bad tear as well at the time. That resulted in me having eight weeks of complete offload, doing no gymnastics, and then trying to get back in that December. Uh, and yeah, that was, again, it was just that whole area was having lots of issues and lots of problems. I understand now that that is an imbalance in the load of my training that was resulting in lots of those injuries. Uh, and I was training a lot, you know, at that time, I'm still training like I'm training when I'm nine or 10 years old, 11, 12 years old, when I've got all that energy and I'm fresh, right? Uh, but now I'm not going to school, so I want more time in the day. So what would happen is my training sessions would extend. Sometimes I'd train for six, seven, eight hours. My routine sessions, I'd meant to, maybe meant to finish at half 12, one o'clock. They'd be carrying on till two o'clock in the afternoon. You know, typically I'd leave rings till the last apparatus because it was in my head, it was the least important, right? Although probably physically it was the most important in terms of my shoulder and the long-term health effects that was going to have on me later in my life so i'd leave that right to the end when i was the most tired the most fatigued and i'd get these routines done um and back then i was training you know six days a week and doing routines tuesday thursday f friday saturday no sorry tuesday wednesday friday saturday so four days of routine every week and if it was a heavy week i was doing two routines on every apparatus that is a huge amount of volume wherever i go at the moment uh, and the gymnastic clubs, clubs that i work in uh the, the trend at the minute is routines just three times a week so typically a tuesday a thursday and a saturday with a day off in between i think that's a m much more manageable uh load particularly when you're doing very high level gymnastics and that's somewhat closer to what I got to towards the end of my career when I trained five days a week. Um, but yeah, that just wasn't there back then. And, you know, I was, I was massively pushing the difficulty. And then, to be honest, between the age of probably t 20 up until 23, I still had shoulder pain. Uh, and I would manage that with excessive amounts of sports massage, um, ice baths, foam rollering, stretching, physios, times painkillers, ice, whatever it might be, um, and being very much like recovery focused and maximizing that. And for that period between London 2012 to Rio 2016, I didn't have too many significant shoulder injuries. I tore my lat, which became a problem. Again, that was on that side. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that weakened that whole area. But um, apart from that, my shoulders were okay. I just managed them. Um, there was, at this point, when I would see somebody about my shoulders, we kind of just accepted the fact that there was lots of, there was a, a real history with my shoulder. Lots of damage had been done in my teenage years. There were lots of old tears. 
uh, small tears in the, the rotator cuff and the ligaments and the tendons. Um, but it was manageable and I was able to get through the training and I had bigger fish to fry because I was dealing with my my ankle at the time, having had that ankle surgery. And we did, we really robustly, I put on a lot of strength, a lot of size, did a lot more rehab. There was a bigger focus on that. I took that seriously from the age of 20 until 23, particularly after my surgery in 20. 14 when I was 21 because I started to really respect the work that the sports science team did so the physios and nutritionists the sports psychologists the strength and conditioning coaches I respected their expertise and I listened to them I opened my ears a little bit um didn't think I was invincible anymore because I'd learned that through that injury with my ankle and so I took that seriously and that helped me to be honest during that time and then after that Rio period that's when the 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 muscle injuries in my shoulder started to pile up um the first one was uh, I tore the long head of my bicep. Um, that was a problem. Uh, it, was, it was very painful. It was actually, um, again, right at the end of the session, trying to do a high bar routine with a casino. To be honest, that summer I hadn't really trained properly. Physically, I wasn't the best prepared. You know, I just kind of felt, well, look, I was almost ready for an Olympic game, so I can have a bit of time off, I can relax, I can go out partying, take a break and then come back and I should be in shape still because... You know, I was in one of the, almost the best shape of my life two months ago, um, but I probably took a few shortcuts. I was trying to do these big skills. I think as well, because of the experience that I'd had, my self-worth was pretty low, so I didn't respect my body very much. I was quite happy to take big risks at that time because I was probably, to be honest, I was a, I was a bit reckless. That's the word that I would use. Uh, I was still very angry, very frustrated, hadn't dealt with that period of my life and the experiences that I'd had and what happened to me it was certainly a trauma definitely a trauma in a different way than maybe somebody passing away or you being in a situation we have a serious injury it was a different kind of trauma I never dealt with that and so sometimes I would go very gung-ho into training I would take big risks at times when I shouldn't at the end of a session after I've been training for four and a half five hours and this one day I remember the lady that was giving me sports massage at the time she was stood at the door waiting for uh, her son to finish training or, or her son had just come to training she dropped him off and she was having a little look and watching because she was working with me closely at the time and I pung off a high bar right at the bottom, tore off the bar, and one arm, and my shoulder went, and she saw it. It was very painful, and that's where I tore the head, long head of my bicep. And, uh, yeah, I had scans on that. They scanned it. Nothing really came up. We kind of went for the approach of uh, just time off, rest, a bit of rehab, and then I ended up competing in a competition very early in that year, in, like, February. Still not right. Uh, it was the American Cup. If you go and watch that competition, it's on YouTube. You can see the video of me competing on the rings, and you can tell my right shoulder is still not okay. Uh, the routine was a little bit easier. I... Actually, the routine was pretty good. Um, it was a bit of an easier routine, but I was in a lot of pain. I mean, I say it was good. It was a struggle for me to do crucifix. It was a struggle for me to train on the rings. Um, I had to really focus for that routine. I was doing very limited training outside of the actual routines where I was putting my hand up. So on the days I didn't have routines, I wouldn't train on rings. That's also pretty commonplace for senior athletes. But, you know, at the time, I was still quite young. I just turned 24. And, uh, yeah, that lingered on. Uh, and then I continued to have more injuries, so... Um, more tears in those shoulders and I think that really culminate, culminated with uh, the neck injury I had in 2019 so um, what started to happen in that year in the first six months of that year is that I would get quite a lot of neck pain and it would almost be like when I'd have when you have a trapped nerve and you wake up and you've slept funny and you can't move your head but they would be pretty serious. They would last for a couple of days. I genuinely wouldn't be able to to move my head. There's actually one of those one of those instances we have on camera. I was in the gym. I was on floor. Uh, it was quite a cold day. I think uh, it was early on in the year. I did a tumble and my neck just went and I couldn't move my head. I knew straight away. I put my hand on the back of my neck. Sam was there filming. We had to finish filming. I went home and that happened multiple multiple times. Uh, the f one time it happened when it was the worst. I, I literally couldn't drive. I couldn't move my head from. I couldn't move my eyes. Just my, I guess my irises from left to right. It was painful, uh, excruciating pain. Um, and you know, at the time I was under a lot of pressure to still compete, still keep my place on the squad. So I kind of pushed through all of that. Did everything that I could. Maximized all the experience that I had. Went to the competition uh, at that British Championships and. 
what I had to start trying to do was try and correct my posture a little bit um, with my neck because essentially I was hinging in my neck. I was doing exactly what I'm doing right now when I'm talking to the camera, I'm looking at you guys. I'm sat with bad posture on my necks like this. And so I had to kind of sit back, lengthen my neck, stretch it out um, because all those kind of like the the discs, I guess, in your neck were like compressing uh, and it was giving me a lot of pain. Um, So it was all compounding. It was like this crescendo of everything that happened over the the whole period of my life back from when you know the the coach had yanked my shoulders and I'd done the crucifix for the for the cameras and you know just doing those sets of inlocates hundreds of times forwards and backwards and not really thinking about what was going on nobody you know in a position of you know I guess nobody in a coaching position was even thinking about that or worried about it either even though it was pretty obvious right because the senior gymnasts at the time all their shoulders were just shot to pieces so you know you could have probably looked at that and back engineered what was going on and maybe reflected but i guess those guys didn't have much education in terms of the sports science either at that time uh, the sport was very much amateur in the early 2000s still and so this all, this crescendo kind of just ended up with me being in so much neck pain that i just couldn't train and i would come to the gym and i'd try to run around the floor and boom i'd be back couldn't move my head again and go home sometimes i'd just sit in my car on the side of the road just waiting for it to calm down just a little bit so I could just drive home. Um, A lot of the time I'd end up walking to the gym, I'd try to warm up, I wouldn't be able to do it. I'd go to David Lloyd, I'd just sit in a sauna. Uh, And uh, that summer is when I went to see the doctor about this, tried to get on top of it, It was like, look, this is just not sustainable. You know, I I don't know what's wrong, but it seems pretty serious. And you know, what's what's interesting around the same time, Niall was, Niall Wilson was having his neck issues. uh, And yeah, they kind of coincided, but for some reason I never really communicated with him and asked him about what was going on with him. But ultimately, what basically was going on was that I was, at the, I was in the early stages of what ended up resulting in neck surgery for Niall. So I had a bulging disc in my neck. It was compression on the nerve that runs down the right-hand side of my body. And uh, I just couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep, man. Like, it, it was awful. And, like, you know, I know now, <laughs> being a dad and not sleeping with Ozzy, like, the damage that that does. And I look at athletes now and I'm like, God, how are you a dad and not sleeping and then still training? Like, I don't know how you do that. I, I was also, you know, not well. I was very unwell. Uh, I had a real mental illness at the time my depression my anxiety was very bad although it hadn't been diagnosed yet and I I didn't have a I didn't have any kind of understanding of that what that meant um and the effect that was having on me physically emotionally mentally in all areas of my life uh and it was through scans on my neck and then seeing the doctor about my neck that my mental health issues came to light they all coincided and I spent the next six months just trying to almost retrain myself to have good posture, lengthen my neck, and uh, incredibly it worked. And I I genuinely didn't think at times this was ever going to be okay. Like, I literally would lie in bed, staring at the ceiling at 3 o'clock in the morning, just waiting for the sun to rise, having known that I've not slept at all, and just absolutely petrified about trying to go to the gym and not being able to do anything again. And it, it was just awful, man. Like, I was, I was just lonely. I was desperate. I just wanted the pain to go away. Not only did I have this pain in my neck constantly, uh, and it was my neck down into my shoulder because that nerve runs right down into your fingers. Um, and I, at the time, I had, you know, I have bad circulation anyway. I have very, very low body fat. Even now, as a retired athlete, my body fat sits at about seven. But on that right-hand side, I get pins and needles. I have bad circulation. My fingers get cold. Um... And it's worrying, right? It's your neck. Like, it doesn't matter how tough you think you are and how much you kind of neglect your body. You know the word neck is serious. And you've, you're thinking, wow, like, what happens if this is my end of my career? I'm getting, tw- I'm 25, 26. Maybe I do gymnastics for a few more years. I've got to have my neck like this for the rest of my whole life. That becomes a little bit more real and a bit more frightening when your career starts to be on the tail end and you're on the decline. And, uh, yeah, anyway, I... I did everything the doctors and the physios told me to. I was fortunately, I, I was able to, because I'd been on the GB squad for so long, I was able to have access to six months of physiotherapy treatment. Um, I was referred to the mental health clinic, so I got therapy through that. I was able to see doctors and get scans, so I really maximized that six months. Um, and I was very lucky because I only had a few days and a few weeks left to go before, so I could, like, 
essentially initiate that and activate it and have that access to those six months. So I'm really grateful for the people at the time. The doctor, I had a, a doctor called Kate. She was amazing. Uh, and physios that had worked with me for a number of years that really helped me during that period of time. And I was able to get those scans. Um, and we got on top of it and I lengthened my neck. And, you know, after that, you would always see me walking around like this. And every time I see myself in a mirror, I'd check my posture, make sure I was sat upright. And I'd work on those stabilizing muscles and it helped, made a big difference. And, you know, for two and a half years after that, up until my final competition, you know, it really did seem to work. And I, I was surprised it was working. I have to say, like, I was surprised it was working, but I, I stuck to it. I kept with it. I did all my rehab, the stabilizing exercises, uh, the stability work. I do a lot of work on an exercise ball, just working on that stability. Kind of the area that was very difficult for me on the rings because I just didn't have that stability. Uh, I didn't necessarily know the complete extent of the damage at the time because I was very frightened to get my shoulders scanned. I was really frightened and worried what they would pick up. I think deep down I had a gut feeling that it was there were some real issues and I just didn't want to have surgery, man. Like I'd heard from people that shoulder surgery was complicated. It didn't always work. Some of my friends had had shoulder surgery. You know, Luke Falwell's just been on the podcast. He had to have so shoulder surgery and it didn't necessarily work straight away. If if, if I remember correctly, I think it was quite complicated. It was a bit difficult. I didn't fancy that. I'd done that with my ankle. I didn't want to do it again. You know, I was already, I was 26, 27 now. I knew that a surgery meant that was it because, you know, if they say six months, it means 12 months. And then getting back to competition means two years. I just didn't have that time anymore, you know? And, um, yeah, maybe that was a bad decision at the time and I should have gone down that route and really explored all, all avenues, but I just wasn't in the right place to be doing that. Like, I think that would have just... I genuinely don't know if I would have been able to completely handle that. I, I just don't think I would have. You know, I was holding on to this belief and this idea and a bit of hope I could still compete again and I could still get to, back to a high level. And I, I think I needed that at that time. Like I, I desperately needed that. Um, without that, I just wouldn't have been able to see uh, the, wo the wood through the trees or the light at the end of the tunnel, I don't think. And that coincided with my mental health issues would have just been an absolute nightmare. So... Um, yeah, I needed that hope. And, it, you know, it probably wasn't the best thing for me physically in the long run, but at the time I kind of needed it. And, you know, after those six months, I was left to my own devices. So I was trying to remember everything I'd learned from all the physios and sports psychologists and strength and conditioning coaches and doctors I'd ever worked with and put that all into practice. And, you know, I came very, very close to getting into my last competition at the British Championships and competing on six apparatus, which would have been an unbelievable achievement. I think the fact that I got within two weeks of doing that was amazing in itself. I have the videos of me doing routines on my laptop, doing six pieces. Um, super proud of that. You know, people will never see that. They'll never, they, they will have never seen that work that went into that, the two and a half years, the 22 weeks in lockdown, the, just the sheer amount of rehab and prehab that I had to do just to be in the right place, to get back onto rings, to apply everything that I ever learned to, you know, give myself the best possible chance of, you know, making that come true. But ultimately, I just couldn't handle it. My shoulder just couldn't hack it. Couldn't handle the load, and it broke down two weeks before the competition. And my ankle started to break down. You know, I rolled my ankle in a control competition, and my shoulder was gone. And, yeah, it just kind of all fell away from me. And then my first routine in that competition on the pommel horse, I tore my rotator cuff. I either tore my rotator cuff again, or what most likely happened is I had a tear already, and I made it worse. And I, I re-injured that issue. Um... I competed, I did my routine. After that, my shoulder was shot for about three months, but I knew what I had to do. I didn't have to train anymore, I was a retired man, right? So I could just focus on the rehab. Um, I was working, laboring, and it was okay. I could manage that, I worked around it. People helped me, uh, other people that I worked with helped me uh, manage the load a little bit. And, you know, my shoulder's been okay since then. Uh, it took me a long time to get it back to kind of full strength. Uh, I'm able to, I was able to lift weights. I was super happy. I was probably stronger than I'd ever been in terms of lifting weights in a weights gym relative to my body weight. I put on a lot of muscle mass last year. And then, yeah, we get to the point where I decide that I'm going to try and play a football season. <laughs> um, uh, I go to preseason training with Kiwith United, uh, a bit eager, a bit excited, and I'm involved in a collision with another player. And my shoulder shoots back like that. I hit the floor. I'm pretty dazed because I've hit him hard. He's fine. I just kind of bounce right off him. Um, 
because I wasn't looking either, so I kind of went head first into him. So I'm sure I was probably a little bit concussed at the time as well. I'm sure it didn't help my neck. There was a bit of compression going on there. Uh, I tried to carry on training, felt a bit sore, and then someone just lightly touched my arm, and I was just in agony. Went home, didn't sleep all night, was on the edge of the bed crying, just in pain. Went to A&E, uh, and then that started the process of investig investigating what was going on with my shoulder because that triggered my neck pain again. Uh, the shoulder pain I could handle, the neck pain just frightened me to death. I was like, I cannot go back to that, like, never sleeping and just being sat up all night, uh, had the stress of that and, you know, never being able to potentially do, like, kind of sport again. So went down the process of getting multiple scans, seeing multiple doctors. I now wasn't part of, uh, you know, the GB setup anymore. I was retired, so I didn't have access to that private healthcare. Um, so scans and stuff took time. I had to wait four, five, six weeks at a time before appointments, going to see people. The communication wasn't as smooth as it used to be. You know, before you'd have physios ring up doctors, doctors ring up physios, and they'd communicate straight away. This would happen in a matter of, like, hours, if not days. You know, if I needed a scan, I could ring up in the morning and they'd send me for a shoulder scan that afternoon, which is pretty incredible. Uh, so if there are any athletes out there that have access to that, like, really, you know, use it and take advantage of it and appreciate it right now because once you're finished and you're then back, I guess, into normal society and you're part of the NHS, um, yeah, that, that process is a very different one. Uh, it was still very good. It was amazing. They helped me. Uh, you know, I told them my history. I gave them the context. I gave them as much as I possibly could. The difficult thing is that... I don't know how you go about this, so if anybody knows that's listening to the podcast, I would be really, really interested to hear about this, but... One thing that's been difficult recently uh, is that even last week when I ended up in hospital, the NHS don't have access to my private doctor notes from my gymnastics career, which is very important, right? Because that gives so much context on the history of my shoulder. Um, and so I think that's definitely one thing I might recommend um, to British Gymnastics sports science team there is if you have an athlete that's going to re retire as part of their retirement and their transition period, I think that all your doctor's notes should be passed over to the NHS so they're there available in the system. So if you end up in A&E and it's... Uh, because the, the, the reality is if you've been doing gymnastics for 20 years at the very highest level, there are going to be injuries that are going to affect you in later in life. Um, there's no way that there's not. It's such a high-impact sport, even though it's not contact with another human. I treat it as contact sport because you're contacting apparatus constantly. It's a high-impact sport. And the chances are that you are going to have recurring issues with past injuries that you you had whilst you were representing your country at the very highest level. So I think, at the very least, those doctor's notes should be passed over to the NHS so that um, that's communicated and they can get those up straight away on a computer screen and they can see the past history because it tells its own story, right? You know, I've sat here today and told you the story and the, the backstory of my shoulder and why I'm at the position that I'm in right now. Uh, and I think that's very useful for medical professionals to be able to see if you are going into hospital and you require scans or potentially surgery. Um, you need to have all of that back history in that context. It's super important. And I think that's one thing that, you know, should be added into the pr the process of transitioning out of the GB setup and the GB team when you retire. It's a no-brainer. It might have been something that no one's thought of. So, yeah, that might be why that doesn't exist at the moment. But I definitely think it's something that, you know, would be really, really useful in the future. And it's just part of that well-being and looking after the athletes. Um, you take care of those athletes, even when they retire, they'll help you and they'll give it back tenfold because they'll, uh, they'll feel obliged to support the sport and, and give back. So, uh, yeah, that's something that could definitely be improved. And, yeah, I went through those scans and uh, the, the shoulder specialist, um, he came into my, my final meeting, which was, I think it was at the very beginning, it was at the end of last year, and uh, he basically said, look, Sam, uh, we find quite a lot of damage and you have a full thickness tear to your infraspinatus, your supraspinatus. I was like, wow, okay, what does that mean? Can you explain it to me? He's like, well, it's pretty remarkable that you're able to compensate, that you were able to com compensate with these injuries during your career and still perform, but you're able to still go to the gym and lift weights now. Um, and basically the rest of your muscles and the rest of your body has just learned to live with it and it's managing it, but it's working around those weaknesses. Uh, and a full thickness tear is essentially, he said that if this is your tendon, I could put my finger f through the hole, the whole way through. I was like, oh, right, that doesn't sound too good. Um, and he was like, right, uh, I want you to come back again. We're going to have another appointment. Uh, and I'm going to bring in the top shoulder guy at the QMC. He's going to have a look at it. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to see uh, what we're going to do. We'll make a plan. 
So I come back, have my next appointment. There's now two people in there, the shoulder specialist and the top guy at the QMC. And the top guy says, look, Sam, we've actually found, looking at your scan results again, I had another look. Uh, we've actually found that you've split the head of your bicep so it doesn't sit where it needs to. It's not attached. Uh, again, you kind of have found a way to work around that. Uh, that's probably why your shoulder sits far forward like this. And if you look at my two shoulders uh, when I'm in the gym, we've just recorded a new vlog in the gym, you'll be able to see it. My right shoulder sits a little higher and a little further forward. It just doesn't sit correctly. It doesn't sit normally. It looks a little bit odd. Uh, and that's probably because of that, the, obviously the history and the damage I've done to that shoulder, but certainly the head of that bicep, the long head of the bicep, uh, it's not attached. It needs essentially reattaching. Uh, so I said, what does that look like? Uh, I kind of I kind of said, is there a way that I could rehab it and they'll magically, like, those holes will fuse back together? And he kind of laughed at me and said, no, they're broken, they need fixing. Um, he said, right now we can fix them, but in 10 years' time, there's no guarantee that we'll be able to do that. The damage might have got even worse, it might be too extensive, and you might be kind of left in a situation where we can't fix them. I was like, right, uh, what would you recommend? And he said, I'm... I would recommend surgery. And I was like, surgery, wow, that scary word. Uh, I was like, well, I'm a gymnastics coach right now. I need to lift kids up. Uh, and I'm also just about to have a son. And there is no way that I'm going to be able to have shoulder surgery and rehab that back and having a son and not being able to lift him up and down. You know, it's turned out to be a very good thing because the way in which the Aussie was born and the, the traumatic event of his birth meant that in those first couple of weeks I was very instrumental and I had to do a lot of the lifting when it comes to actually him and changing him and doing a lot of that because Cody couldn't you know initially in the first kind of week or so um so it's a good job I didn't do it because it, we really did need me you know I had to be hands-on um so I sat down with them and he said the top guy said look um ultimately what's going to happen is you're going to be at a greater chance of struggling with arthritis in that shoulder when you get older. I just watched my, my, my granddad, you know, towards the end of his life, struggle with his shoulders completely deteriorate, deteriorating. There was nothing there. You know, he was in pain with them in agony all the time. He couldn't really lift his arms up. And I was like, well, I don't want that for myself. You know, I've seen that. I've seen that play out. That's not fun. I'm only 31 right now. You know, if I'm, having, if I'm in pain now and struggling now, what's it going to be like in another 10, 20, 30, 40 years? And he was like, look, I am prepared to give you a two-year open appointment with me. That means that if something happens in the next two years and you decide that you want to get the surgery done, you've got a direct line straight to me and I will do it for you and I'll fix your shoulder. Uh, I asked him how long we'd be looking at. He said, pretty straightforward. You'd be six weeks in a sling, three months of rehab. Um, you know, I know from my experience that that probably means six weeks in a sling, six months of rehab, maybe another three months of getting back to doing full exercise. Uh, it's obviously going to massively impact my ability to coach, lift gymnasts up. Um, and at the time, I just felt like I can't do this right now. Um, and, and I think a little bit, I wanted to just put it to one side. I had bigger fish to fry, right? I was about to have a baby. There was a lot going on in my life externally outside of just my own issues. So I put that to one side on the back burner, but I was felt confident in the fact that I had that open two-year appointment. And last week... Um, and that, and that injury, I have to say, like, calm down. I got back into the gym. I've been lifting weights again. I've been doing jujitsu, which, you know, my big concern doing jujitsu was, right, people are going to get me in chokeholds. Um, is that going to be a good idea with my neck? You know, I often come out and my neck is stiff and it's sore. And I asked the coach recently, is there anything I can do to strengthen my neck? And he said, not really. You just kind of have to, like, keep doing it and you'll be able to manage the load. You'll get used to it. Uh, that is something that I find a little bit... That is my big concern when I do jiu-jitsu, which is tough because I love it, man. Like, I enjoy it so much, but physically it's a real contact sport. Like, that's not messing around. It's not like football or gymnastics. You really are like going head-to-head -head with somebody else and you you don't quite know. And a lot of the time, like the people that I spar with are a lot bigger than me, you know, a lot bigger than me. And the big guys, and they get hold of my neck and they're strangling me. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm always tapping out. I'm very quick to tap out, but, you know, I'm not used to it and I can make lots of mistakes because I don't know what I'm doing. So, uh, yeah, that, that does worry me a little bit. But, um, yeah, so I got back to doing everything like that, playing football again. Um, my shoulder in itself, I would have, it would ache after I'd do different bits of, like, everyday type things. Like, I've been doing the garden recently, getting it, a sore shoulder if I'd done work. But, you know, generally it would be okay. And then last week I woke up Tuesday morning uh, and I just, I, 
I, I felt stiff. It was that, ah, uh, maybe I've trapped my nerve. And sometimes it will go away, right? Like it'll be a six hour thing or a day thing and then you wake up the next day and it's fine. Uh, but it got progressively worse throughout the day. The problem was I had a full school day event. I went to the school. It was a bit stiff and sore. Had to do a standing back somersault. Did the standing back somersault, yanked my neck back, and then it got progressively worse throughout the day to the point at which, you know, I was grimacing, closing my eyes, almost crying. I taught 250 kids to do forward rolls and cartwheels, demonstrated them. You know, I was just in extreme pain. I couldn't hide it. The teachers noticed it. They were all asking me if I was okay, if I wanted any pain. I was like, yeah, yeah, I was fine. You know, I promised to do that work. I'm going to do it. I finished the day, and then I rang Connie. I was like, I'm in agony with my neck. Uh, something's happened. I'm going to drive home. I think I'll be okay. Like, I managed to get home. It was a struggle. I was struggling to look in my wind mirrors. Uh, I got home, and by the time I got home, I was like this, and I just couldn't move my head. I was in a lot of pain. Connie, when she's nervous, she laughs. She was laughing at me. I was like, don't laugh. What are you laughing for? Like, this isn't good. I literally can't move my head. She was like, you're going to have to go to a &E. And I was like, can I not just have a hot bath and see if it goes away? I'm still hoping, like, crossing my fingers it will go away. She's like, no, you need to go because if you have to go in the middle of the night, that's going to be a nightmare if it's just me and Ozzy left on our own. So I rang my dad. I was like, Dad, can you drop me off at a &E? And at this point, I'm in, like, extreme pain. And when I, I say pain, it's like a 9 or a 10 out of 10. Every time I move my head, it feels like the, my, that nerve is being compressed. Somebody's got a knife in the back of my head and they're just twisting it around. It's on fire. And every time my dad was going over a speed bump or changing direction, going around the roundabout, I was screaming. And I could tell he was panicking and freaking out because your neck, right? And I get there to A&E and I sit in A&E for five hours like this. Um, I thought they'd see me pretty quick because it was my neck and I couldn't move my neck but it was super busy. They were stretched as always, like it is now. Um, I was fed up. I was like, I've spent too much time in this place, man, in the last 18 months since I got back from traveling, like I'm sick of it. Uh, and I just sat there just very quietly. Uh, I got given some morphine and diazepam, which made a massive difference because I was in a lot of pain. I just sat there. Uh, I, every time I like, moved my head just a little bit, it was hard to sit there like this for so long and my muscles were tensing up and spasming. You know, I'd just be that screaming pain. I'd squeeze my teeth and my jaw and close my eyes. And uh, that made a difference. The morphine and diazepam, diazepam, like, relaxed my neck. It was like a relaxant. So that started to relax, and then the morphine took the edge off the pain. I managed to finally see uh, a doctor. And I, one thing that I do really well now is whenever I see somebody medical, when it's a doctor, I give them everything, all the context. So they've got as much information as they can. He, again, struggled to find the notes on my bulging disc in my neck, so he had to just take my word for it. And that's where I thought, oh, God, why do the notes not get passed over, man? This would be so helpful in this situation, especially with my neck, right? Neck's serious. He said, look, Sam, I think it's a combination of lots of things. The old injuries, um, the fact that you're sleeping on a blow-up bed, <laughs> and you're not, you've not had much sleep for four months. Probably the stress of that, being a new dad, managing work, uh, those old injuries, you might have just laid, slept on it funny and it's aggravated it and it's just kicked off. I am going to book you in to see this spinal clinic next week uh, to have a, take a look at that neck again, and I'm going to give you lots of painkillers. So he gave me uh, codeine, diazepam, and uh, naproxen. Uh, I also said to him, look, when I was 18, I got addicted to painkillers, although I didn't know that I was addicted to them at the time. Are any, this sounds like you're giving me a lot of painkillers. Is there any that I should be a bit wary of? He said the only one you need to worry about is the codeine. Uh, only take it for its course uh, because you can become addicted to that one. Um, again, just gave him all the context. Don't mess around. Told him about my mental health. Again, he said, look, your neck could be related with your mental health if it's been tough at the moment you've had a difficult year and um yeah he kind of sent me on my way he was he was very good actually he was brilliant uh and i have to say yeah for all of those experiences in the last 18 months as much as some of them have been tough especially when we were in hospital for ozzy in the time after he was born it was very difficult and we had a bad experience some of the health professionals that i've seen in the last 18 months have been incredible man they've been absolutely amazing so uh yeah, those people are heroes, and yeah, he was amazing. He managed to get me up to the pharmacy quickly. He was very conscious that it was going to shut soon. I got all the medication, came home, uh, but I decided I'm only going to take the naproxen for the inflammation. I'm going to, I don't want to take the diazepam. I don't want to take the 
the codeine. Uh, I already felt high as a kite at that point. <laughs> my, I was laughing my head off. My legs were like vibrating. I felt like I was... I always say when I'm like been on like heavy drugs for an injury, my the feeling that I have of it is like I feel golden. It's weird. It feels like everything's like got a tinge of yellow and like... Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm definitely a person that shouldn't experiment with drugs. <laughs> definitely not after my past experiences. Um, but yeah, so I took the naproxen for like a day and then stopped and actually next day calmed right down I was still stiff but I could move my head a little bit um the Wednesday I didn't have much to do uh I actually cancelled my coaching at David Lloyd <sighs> much to the reluctance of me Connie forced me to I didn't want to do it but I did it, it was definitely the right decision because I needed a whole day at home I hadn't slept I was you know in that pain um and it was good I got a whole day with Aussie and that helped me massively and then the next day I went into the gym told Josh uh, the boys were just getting ready for the British team championships, so there wasn't much coaching that I had to do. He didn't do any supporting, just sat there, kind of watched, analysed, gave some feedback. Uh, and then, yeah, it's just got better since. But uh, I have my shoulder clinic after this podcast. I'm going to go to, sorry, the spinal clinic. going to go there, see what comes of that. I'll take a look at it. Um, but now I have a decision to make, and I think uh, it frightened me, uh, this. I was really worried. I was worried that I'd go to that hospital and because of this, the pain that I was in, they were going to say, we're going to, you, you know, you've had slipped a disc, we're going to have to do surgery on it, we're going to have to fix it. And that was f panicking me. Um, I'm happy it's gone away, but I'm not convinced and I'm not confident that this is not going to come back in some way, shape or form at some point uh, because it's been too many times now, I think. There's a real weakness there, like a kink in the armour. Uh, and I, I think I'm going to explore that option of having surgery to fix the shoulder because that damage I have on that right side must be a key factor in why I'm getting this next neck pain. Uh, and I think it could only help. And I'm trying to think about my future. I want to be able to do sport and lift Aussie up and, you know, use that side of my body for as long as I possibly can. And I don't want to end up like my granddad. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, I'm going to yeah explore what comes of the neck. Uh, assessment today uh, and then I'm going to look at potentially having surgery on that shoulder next summer um, tie it in with the summer holidays when I've not got schools and see if I can get it done and get it fixed and yeah because I don't want this man like, it's horrible like that neck pain honestly is frightening and you know I often say like I wouldn't change anything right because I'm the person I am today and I still think that's the case but there are times where I do wish that I had put myself first respected my body more uh, and kind of realized a few things. I wrote down a few lessons, I think, that have kind of come out of this process in the last week of thinking about this. I've got them written on my phone, so I'm going to read them out because um, I don't want to forget them because my hope is that a young athlete or a coach will listen to this and it might change their outlook and their perspective a little bit. Uh, and the next time that they maybe have an injury and they want to force through it and push through it or get back quick, it might change their mind. They might remember this conversation and and think about their future a little bit more and try and broaden their horizons, zoom out and remember that at 18, 19, you still could potentially have 10 years left in the sport. So what's the point in rushing for the sake of doing one competition in two months' time? There isn't one. Like, it's crazy. Um, so, yeah, the first thing that I wrote down was, I'm now ultimately paying for the years of intense gymnastics training, which at times was 100% excessive. It was it 100% was excessive. Like, it was way too much. There was no reason I should have been doing 40 hours a week at 10 years old. There was no reason I should have been doing 35, 40 hours a week at 18, 19, 20. A lot of that training was not purposeful. It was training for the sake of training. It was just doing more hours and more numbers. A lot of it was ego. A lot of it was me thinking I'm better than other people because I'm tougher than other people and I can take more shit. That is stupid and I should have never done that. And I now do regret that I had that mindset. Um... I also uh, feel like there were decisions made at the time. <laughs> I believe that you should be very weary of taking on the advice of people that don't have to dis deal with the, the consequences of the decisions that you make. So you should listen to that advice 100%. You have to be weary of like, is this person going to be around when I'm dealing with the consequences of my actions right now in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, 30 years' time? And the reality is coaches and support team and whoever it might be, 
they're not going to deal with my shoulder for the rest of my life. I'm dealing with it. And I made those decisions that were at the time, uh, on many occasions, supported by coaches and support staff. But they were my decisions to make. But they're they weren't going to affect their future. They were going to affect mine and they were going to have other athletes after me. That always happens, you know? And I think at the time you feel like you're on this journey together, right? It's me and my coach, it's me and Sergey. But when it comes to that time when you retire, it's not that anymore. It doesn't follow you with the rest of your life. It's you, you and your body. And yeah, those decisions you make like do have a real impact, especially when you're doing a sport like gymnastics where you are training like 30, 40 hours a week is... It's nuts, isn't it? That's mental. You say that to someone, they don't believe you. You can't compute that. You can't compute a nine-year-old training 40 hours a week. <laughs> How does that work? Like, it just doesn't make sense, does it? But, like, we, we really did that. We were doing that. Uh, and there was lots of us doing that. And, yeah, I, I'm sure we all bear the bruises and scars from that. And so, yeah, I think that the training at the time was definitely excessive. Uh, and there's been a massive shift in that, for sure. I explained that guys only train, typically only do routines three days a week instead of one. That's a 25% reduction in the intensity of their training every week, right? That's a that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. You know, I typically train, a lot of the senior athletes just train once a day. You know, most of the senior gymnasts back in 2012, around that time, were still doing two hour, two sessions a day, training six, seven hours. Guys are just training one hour. They have access to a lot more recovery. They emphasis, They put a big emphasis on recovery now. Uh, and resting so do the coaches they're more educated so it is a completely different landscape right now um but at the time when i was younger and i was growing up it was 100 percent excessive uh and the training wasn't purposeful it was training for the training's sake it was training because if something went wrong we would just do more um rather than thinking about really analyzing the skills and breaking it down back engineering it thinking about the biomechanics of that skill um so yeah that was the first thing that i wrote down as a lesson the second thing my character and personality traits have always steered towards the extreme. I've always been like that since I was a kid. It was always excessive. Um, so it makes sense in that training. And I think if you are an athlete or you are a person with those character traits, that means that you are a grafter and a hard worker and you'll always do more. You'll want to do extra. You'll stay later at training. You need people that can pull you back and hold you back a little bit because you're always going to push yourself and you're going to push yourself harder than anyone else is going to push you. So you need the right people around you that can spot things that you can't see and they can pull you back, hold you back um, and make sure that you're not overtraining and burning out and overdoing it and putting yourself at risk when you don't need to. Um, for me, you know, I know now that having been diagnosed with my obsessive compulsive personality disorder, it's obsessive, right? <laughs> It makes so much sense that I was obsessive with my gymnastics training, obsessive with, you know, any element of my preparations towards my gymnastics career. They were always excessive, and it makes sense that I'm like that, right? It makes sense that I'm obsessive in the way that I prepare for things. Um, so knowing that and having that self-awareness is huge, but it also, you know, I was always going to take it to the extreme because I'm hardwired that way, I'm built that way. So I think trying to develop an understanding and a self-awareness of who you are how you work, the inner workings of your, I guess, your being and, like, what makes you tick is huge. And if you can do that from an early age and if you can do that and you have access to working with someone like a sports psychologist or working with mentors, people that you respect, who can give you advice, former athletes, like, do that. It will help you. It will help you build your own self-awareness of understanding who you are and how you operate in the world. Um, so, yeah, that would be my advice uh, and the lessons learned from that. Uh, the next one was, uh, I want to put my future first and make the smart decision, but it's difficult, as on most things in life. Even now, I'm tussling with it, right? Like, I hate the idea that I won't, might not be able to go to the gym for a year or lift weights, do a bit of gymnastics, go into schools, support coaching, do jujitsu. I hate it because sport for me is the thing that makes me feel alive, man. It's the thing that makes me happy. It's the thing that I resonate with the most. It's the thing that has brought me so much joy in my life. It's the thing that I understood when I was a kid. I didn't understand school. School didn't make sense to me, but sport and using my body, that did. I got it straight away. It was like it was in every fiber of my being. Sport and doing sport, just it's me. That's who I am. I'm an athlete. I keep getting asked all the time what I am at the moment, and I, I find it hard to say. I'm like, well... 
I have podcasts. I'm a podcaster. I've got a podcast. I do that. I go into schools and I deliver school events and I coach. I'm an athlete at heart. I always will be. It's my favorite thing to do in life outside of being a dad now and being a partner to Connie and being, you know, a family member. So a son, a grandson, a, a brother, an uncle. My favorite thing in life is doing sport. If I could just do sport for the rest of my life as a job, that's all I would do. I love it, man. It makes me feel so happy. Like, it makes me feel good. And so the idea of not being able to do that frightens me. But sometimes in life, you have to take a small step back to take a big step forward. And actually, for the first time, and not the first time, because I've, begin, I've started to do this over a number of years, ever since my mental health diagnosis when I was 26, I want to put my health and my future health first because it's a smart thing to do. And I want to learn from my granddad's mistakes. I want to learn from the mistakes I made in the past and not make that same decision again. Because if I do that and I'm in a position where I can't move my neck again in five or ten years' time and it's at a point where my shoulder can't be fixed, then I'm an absolute fool. So uh, I'm going to do that, I think. I'm going to put my future self first. And that would be my advice for all athletes. Make sure that you respect yourself and you put your, you put your body and your future because first because after you finish your career in gymnastics, gymnastics is a short career, man. You're going to finish in your mid-20s, early 30s if you're incredibly lucky and you're one of the very, very few and you're going to have a whole life ahead of you. Uh, and right now, that might not interest you. You might be completely in the moment. That's what you need to be. But once you get towards the end of the career and you're 25, 26, and you're thinking about retirement, trust me, that becomes very important in a very short space of time. So make sure you're putting yourself first and remember that not even your coach, even your coach isn't going to have to deal with the consequences of the damage you do to your body while you're training when you're in your younger years and you're an athlete. Um, that's going to be up to you to deal with for the rest of your life. So, yeah, make sure you're putting yourself first when it comes to that one. Uh, next one uh, yeah you have to deal with the consequences that uh, of the decisions you make in the long run we spoke about that and I've already covered that uh, and so really taking that in and then I guess the last thing that I've written down and this is more of a positive one for me I guess is that my ankle was fixed it was fixed when I had that surgery. The surgeon did an incredible job and he fixed my ankle and my ankle was an absolute mess and after that I went on to have a career that lasted Wow, I mean, my career lasted for another seven years in gymnastics and I competed at the very highest level. Um, became very close to becoming a two-time Olympian. Had some incredible achievements, became the English champion. Finished sixth all around at the European Championships. Uh, medaled on floor at the British Championships. Medaled at a World Cup, um, a World Cup event on floor. Went on to win medals again at major championships. So I had an amazing career, man. Uh, had an amazing ride. Retired as a British champion at 28, all thanks to that surgeon that was able to fix my, fix my ankle uh, and the incredible support of the medical team around me. Also my own resilience, um, and my ability to take on board everything that I was being told at that time, take a step back, appreciate that I didn't know everything. Uh, I wasn't a superhuman, and I had to try and try and do my very best to uh, listen to everything that everybody was advising me at the time. And, you know, it worked. My ankle got fixed. So, uh, you know, I'm able now to go about my everyday life. I'm happy. Uh, and I can play contact sport on that ankle. So that should probably be a sign to me that, you know, chances are that if I have shoulder surgery, it will fix it. And maybe I won't be in this pain anymore. And maybe that residual pain that I have all the time in my right hand and the pins and needles that I get and the... Uh, the coldness that I get in my little two fingers because of that nerve damage, maybe that will go away. Maybe it'll be fixed if I have that surgery right now. Maybe it'll be one of the best things that I ever do, one of the best decisions I ever make for myself. So, yeah, I think I have to use that as a real positive. Um, and, yeah, draw from the fact that, you know, lots of my friends have had so shoulder surgery and they've gone on to continue. Joe Fraser, been on the podcast in the last 12 months, had that shoulder surgery, won the British Championships, British champion. So, yeah, use that, take those positives, uh, and actually use it as a new challenge, right? You know, okay, if anybody's good at rehab, it's me. So, you know, can I have this surgery, and can I spend 12 months getting back and see if I can get, better, back, get back stronger and fitter than before? And maybe I'll have no pain when I come back and I'm doing exercise, and that would be an amazing thing. So, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this episode today. Um... Hopefully it'll be a very, very useful one for young athletes and young coaches alike, and also parents as well. Parents play a key role. Parents can definitely uh, help advise their, their, their children, their young athletes, uh, and also just be in the loop when it comes to the, the stuff that's going on in the gym and the injuries they have. I think quite often, you know, kids can just kind of bat their parents off to one side and, you know, just listen to, to coaches and 
and just listen to support team. But actually, you know, the two people that are going to support you when you you finish and are going to deal with the consequences more closely than your coaches and the support team that you work with throughout your career are your parents. So, you know, their opinion is, is really important. You should listen to that. Uh, and they'll always have your best interest. Out of anybody in the world, your parents, I know this now because I have a son, those are the two people that will always have your best interests at heart um, and they'll always have your back. So, yeah, listen to your parents. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for the reviews that we had on the last episode. I picked a winner. Uh, really cool. Um, it was amazing to hear about his experiences, so I'm going to get that posted out to him. Uh, and again, you know, you can review the podcast for us. It's great. You can leave us a, a rating. Um, we have 97 ratings now. It'd be great to get that to 100. If we could have 100 ratings on Spotify, that would be amazing. Same on, on Apple and on YouTube. You know, if you can like the video, make sure you subscribe. Uh, we're very close to releasing our first vlog again on YouTube. It's going to be a visual vlog. It's me back in the gym. I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, lots of the stories that we have is essentially an extension of the podcast. Um, and yeah, we're excited about it. It's going to be cool. We're going to follow my journey uh, in the gym and out of the gym. And um, yeah, uh, I'm going to get off now to the to the hospital again to have this uh, appointment at the spinal clinic, see what comes of it. But uh, I hope everyone has a great week. Uh, thank you for supporting the podcast, listening to it. And um, yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.